Hi, and welcome to the third exam in the series. Um, not necessarily the most exciting one. Uh, in fact, if you suffer with insomnia, this is the ideal exam for you. We're going to go through um, the full contents, breaks down to about eight uh, lessons, broken into multiple parts. Uh, there's going to be questions and answers at the end of it. Um, if you can manage to stay awake, it would be wonderful. Um, it is a, a painfully long um, and very unexciting topic, but it's got to be done. Um, so we're going to go through, obviously, this first one, which will cover the uh, general air law, then we'll go on to personal licensing, airworthiness of aircraft and aircraft equipment, general operating and flight rules, flight planning and prep, air traffic services, airspace and aerodrome and, her and heliport laws, and emergency incidents and accidents. So that's how it breaks down. Um, we are going to cover the, the core components and it's based around the exam requirements. Um, the same way that the, the, the exams are, are laid out. So there are various aspects um, broken down into points by which they measure um, effectiveness of learning. So um, in the various aspects, 4.2, 4.4, 4.6 is what we're going to cover um, for the general air law stuff in this first lesson. Um, they can always be referred back to the books and the AIP uh, volume 1. Um, for, for that relative information. So, so as I don't bore you, because this certainly will, um, we'll crack on. So 4.2 is the first component of, of the uh, air law testing scenario. Um, and so we'll start with the aviation legislation, uh, and specifically 4.2.2, which describes the requirements to hold an aviation document is laid out in the Civil Aviation Act 1990, Section 7. Now, section 7 goes through all of the very, very boring components um, for the requirements of an aviation document. So, number one, rules made under this Act may require that an aviation document shall be required by or in respect of all or any of the following. New Zealand registered aircraft, aircraft pilots, flight crew members, air traffic service personnel, aviation security service personnel, aircraft maintenance personnel, air services, ATS, uh, aerodrome and aerodrome operators, navigation installation providers, aviation training organisations, aircraft design manufacturer and maintenance organisations. Um, aeronautical procedures, aviation security services, aviation meteorological services, aviation communication services, any person services or things within any of the classes specified in paragraphs A to P. Such other persons, aircraft, aeronautical products, aviation related services, facilities and equipment operated in support of the civil aviation system or classes of such persons, aircraft, aeronautical products, aviation related services, facilities, equipment operated in support of the civil aviation system, as may in the interests of safety or security be specified in the rules. And it goes on, any person who is an aviation examiner or medical examiner, um, the requirements, standards and application procedure for each aviation document and the maximum period for which each document may be issued shall be prescribed by rules made under this Act. And that Act is the Civil Aviation Act of 1990, Section 7. <sighs> We've got through a fair bit already. Subject to any rules made under this Act, an aviation document may be issued by the Director for such specific period and such and subject to such conditions as the director considers appropriate in each particular case. We will constantly go over how important the director of the Civil Aviation Authority is and we'll see how instrumental uh, he is referenced in, in these acts. So just remember that the director, any of the director's nominees um, and police officers fall under pretty much everything to do with the Civil Aviation Air Law. Um, and any 
person in respect of whom any decision is taken under this section may appeal against the decision to district court under section 66. Remember that section 66 does come up every now and again in the exam, so I'm told. Um, I haven't heard it for a while, but it, it does exist. So if you need to appeal against any decision made by the director, it can be appealed to in the district court under section 66. Now, all of that aside, what this basically means is that I need you to think of the requirement for aviation documents as a requirement for all employees, equipment and companies who supply the aviation industry with the service. That's absolutely anything that interacts with the aviation services. Um, this is to cover the, the basic security, the protection, the safe flight, everything that comes into that umbrella. Now this is to prevent uncertified companies or people compromising aviation safety or security. Documents must meet Civil Aviation Act standards and be issued for a specific period. So there's no indefinite periods when it comes to the issuing of, of CAA documentation, right? Right, that's the first bit out of the way. 4.2.4 <coughs> describes the criteria for the fit and proper person test as laid down in the Civil Aviation Act 1990, Section 10. Now, Section 10 specifies the criteria for the fit and proper person test. Any of you who have had uh, firearms licenses, um, a, a, exactly the same um, fit and proper person measurement criteria is held under there. So listen, we're going to quickly read through this um, and, and, and just bang it out, and then we'll get down to a summary of understanding. So, for the purpose of determining whether or not a person is fit and proper for any purpose under the Act, the Director, again, shall, having regard to the degree and nature of the person's proposed involvement in New Zealand's civil aviation system, have regard to and give such weight as the Director considers appropriate to the following. The person's compliance history with transport safety regulation and requirements. The person's related... Now, actually, that's kind of interesting, right? So, A, the person's compliant history with transport safety regulation requirements. That also means that transport safety can be speeding fines, drunk and disorderly, um, drunk in charge of a motor vehicle, um, a speeding, uh, a, a combination of speeding fines uh, within a succinct period of time shows that you are not compliant with transport safety regulation requirements. Remember that. Um, so that, that's one of the fundamental measurement sticks on, on how they, they regard whether you are a fit and proper person. <coughs> B, the person's related experience, if any, within the transport industry. The person's knowledge of applicable civil aviation system regulatory requirements. Any history of physical, mental health or serious behavioural problems. Again, anyone who's applied for a firearms licence, those same questions get asked for you at that point. Uh, any conviction for any transport safety offences, whether or not the conviction was in New Zealand, in a New Zealand court, or the offence was committed before the commencement of this Act. Any evidence that the person has committed a transport safety offence, or has contravened or failed to comply with any rule made under that Act. In the cases where a New Zealand AOC, excuse me, with ANZA privileges applies, the person's compliance with the conditions specified in Section 11G4. Don't worry about too much about that, that's not going to come up. That does come up later on um, in your commercial, but certainly not in your private. Continuing Section 10, the Director shall not be confined to consideration of the matters specified in some Section 1 and may take into account other such matters and evidence as may be relevant. Uh, the director may, for the purpose of determining whether or not a person is fit and proper, uh, do the following. Seek and receive such information, including medical reports, as the director thinks fit, and consider information obtained from any source. Um, subsection 1 applies to the body corporates within the following modifications, and I'll explain the body corporate later. Um, paragraphs A, B, C, D, E, F, G of that subsection should be read as if they refer to the body corporate and its officers. Paragraph D of that subsection shall be read, uh, and it just goes on. This stuff isn't actually material to the exam, uh, but it's, it's good for an awareness. If the director proposes to take into account any information that is or may be 
prejudicial to a person, the director shall, subject to subsection 6, disclose that information to the person and, in accordance with section 11, give that person a reasonable opportunity to refute or comment on it. And that's even before you take it to a district court. Um, so that's basically saying, no matter what, if, if there is going to be third party information, it has to be presented to you in order for you to refute or explain the claims. Uh, nothing in subsection 5 should require the director to disclose any information, the disclosure of which would be likely to endanger the safety of any person. If the director determines not to disclose any information in reliance on subsection 6, the director must inform the person of the fact and non-disclosure thereof. And, in the case of a non-disclosure to an individual or information about the individual, the information that he will have to inform the individual that he or she may, under the Privacy Act of 1993, complain to the Privacy Commission about the non-disclosure, and the provisions of that Act apply to the non-disclosure as if the fo following a request under that Act for the information withheld, the information had been withheld under Section 27.1D of that Act, and uh, in any other cases, Inform the person that the person may seek a review by an ombudsman of that non-disclosure under the Official Information Act of 1982, and the provisions of that Act apply to the non-disclosure as if the f as if following a request under that Act for the information withheld, the information had been withheld under Section 60 of that Act. So what that roughly means, uh, translating into logical terms, because that's all you're going to be able to, to relate it back to. You have to think that the director is able to consider any information he or she thinks may be relevant when determining if a person is a fit and proper person to hold a document under this Act. If this information is going to be is going to prejudice your application, the director must inform you so that you're able to comment or refute. The director does not have to disclose this information to you if it will endanger the safety of any person. Well, that's just to get out a jail-free card for the director. However, the director has to let you know that he or she is or has considered information that will not be disclosed to you, and there is a process for you to follow to get access to that information, and that's under the, the Freedom of Information Act. You must maintain your fit and proper person status and inform the director if this changes, i.e. motor vehicle convictions, dangerous driving, drunk in charge, or anything that could affect your fit and proper person status. Um, the onus is always on you to inform the director, um, even when it comes down to returning your license. You, you have to return it to the director, he's not going to accept it, but it says within the Act that you have to return it to the director, his nominee, or a police officer. Right? So that's that catchment. But you must maintain the fit, and, it's your responsibility to maintain your fit and proper person status and inform the director if any of these things changes. All right. 4.2.6. Uh, describe the duties of a pilot in command as laid down in the Civil Aviation Act 1990, Section 13 and 13A. S13, duties of the pilot in command, which will be you once you pass. So, the pilot in command of an aircraft shall be responsible for the safe operation of an aircraft in flight, the safety and well-being of all passengers and crew, and the safety of cargo carried, and have the final authority to control the aircraft while in command, and for the maintenance of discipline of all persons on board, and subject to Section 13A, be responsible for the compliance with all relevant requirements of this Act and regulations and rules made under this Act. Now, that's highlighted for a reason. You can get questions like this coming up on the exam. Um, and it will basically say the pilot in command of an aircraft shall do what? Um, so those are the things that you're responsible for. Please remember Section 13A under this particular subject. So be responsible for compliance with all relevant relevant requirements of this Act, regulations and rules under. So the responsibility is for you to A, know and understand the law and what you're responsible uh, to be able to make compliance thereof. <sighs> right, uh, 4.2.8 describes the responsibilities of a license holder with respect to changes in their medical condition as laid down in the Civil Aviation Act 1990, Section 27. And 27 Section C it covers the changes in medical condition for a license holder. And this is a very, very common question. So 
be aware of it. Subject to any directions that the director may issue under the section 27G1B, if a license holder is aware of or has reasonable grounds to suspect any change in his or her medical condition, or the existence of any previous undetected medical conditions that may interfere with the safe exercise of the privileges to which his or her medical certificate relates, uh, the, uh, the license holder must, as you, advise the director of any changes as soon as practicable. Um, that doesn't mean as, 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 as possible, just practical, so with, within a, um, a, a, a fair time frame. Um, and may not exercise the privileges to which that license holder's medical certificate relates. And those two are, are really quite important, right? So you must advise the director or nominee um, of any changes as soon as practicable not as soon as possible or immediately as soon as practicable and you may not exercise the privileges to which the license holders medical certificate relates which means you're basically suspending your license until further investigation etc 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 right subject to any directions that the director may issue under section 27 g1b if an aviation examiner or medical examiner or operator is aware of or has reasonable grounds to suspect any change in medical condition of that license holder or the existence of any previously undetected medical conditions in the license holder that may interfere with the safe exercise of the privileges to which the license holder's medical certificate relates. The aviation examiner, medical examiner or operator must advise both the license holder, that's you, and the director of the change as soon as practicable. The general directions and emergency directives, which is the 27G, 1B, the director may, by notice in the Gazette, issue general directions in relation to providing exceptions for temporary medical conditions to the reporting requirements set out in 27GC. So, if you notice any changes in your medical condition or suspect that your medical condition has changed, you must advise the director as soon as practicable. If you're AME, uh, medical examiner or operator, the company you work for, if, if you're working within the industry, but otherwise, um, just basically anyone that holds uh, office or, or, or relational terms back to comment on your state of mental health, physical health, um, whatever, they need to make that aware. Um, so anyone who is aware of or suspects change in your medical condition, they must advise. So the onus thing that goes on them um, must advise you and tell the director in, uh, of the change in your medical condition as soon as practical. Section 4 and 5 under this part guard the AME against criminal proceedings, um, the operator against criminal proceedings, but by the same token it makes them responsible for those actions. Uh, section 27G1B states the director can make exceptions for temporary medical conditions so that they are not having to be reported. Um, so if there's a wide out, out cry of, of the flu, um, you can just call out in the Gazette, look, it's been tested and, and you know, we're relatively happy from a, from a CIA perspective. <sighs> That's 4.2.6. 4.2.10. Describe the responsibilities of a license holder with respect to the surrender of a medical certificate as laid down by the Civil Aviation Act 1990, Section 27. Revocation, suspension, amendment and surrender. If the director has reasonable grounds to believe that a license holder may be unable to exercise safely the privileges to which the license holder's medical certificate relates, the director may, by written notice to the license holder, suspend any medical certificate issued, um, and this is generally in relation to a third party going back to the director and going, hey, I don't think he's fit. Um, or impose an amendment, uh, impose or amend any conditions, restrictions or endorsements on your certificate. Um, most of you are going to have like a clean, unrestricted um, class two medical certificate. It says, look, you, you, you're fine and dandy to go fly. But if you've got uh, some kind of myopathy in, in your eye, it suddenly it just comes out of nowhere, um, you need to wear glasses, you can get that Ex exception added to your, your class too. Um, so it says, yes, you can fly, but under these conditions. Um, 
and so they can be endorsed on your medical certificate to the license holder. If the director has reasonable grounds to believe that the license holder is unable to exercise safely the privileges to which the license holder's medical certificate relates, the director must, by written notice to the license holder, suspend medical certificate issued to the license holder, revoke any medical certificate issued to the license holder, and impose or amend any conditions, restrictions, or endorsements on that medical certificate issued to the license holder. A person who has had his or her medical certificate revoked, withdrawn or suspended, or who is disqualified from holding the medical certificate for the spe uh, specified period must surrender that medical certificate to the director, a person authorised by a director, or a constable. So, highlighted for a reason. You need to make sure that you surrender the medical certificate to the director, a person authorised by the director, or a constable. Uh, constable being a warranted sworn officer of the law, um, all of which they know what to do with. But that is a very, very common question, um, and they are testing 4.2.10, 4.2.6, uh, and 4.2.12 as well. All right, 4.2.10 continued. Um, if the director issues a notice under the section, the director must also, if practicable, Notify any aviation document holder affected by that notice. So if you were a commercial pilot, you would have to inform your um, your boss uh, by notice. And other than license holder, if the director is reasonable, considers it necessary for reasons of aviation safety and security. And may notify any other affected aviation document holder. Any license holder may return his or her medical certificate to the director and ask the director in writing to cancel the medical certificate. So you're throwing in the cards, so I'm not going to be fit to fly for the rest of my life, so cancel it, it's all good. Um, and if a license holder asks the director to cancel his or her medical certificate, the director must cancel that and update the register of current medical certificates. So, broken down in English. Once the director is informed of your medical condition, the director can suspend, revoke, or impose restrictions on your medical certificate. Now this depends on the advice the director receives in regard, uh, regarding if your medical condition is going to affect your ability to operate safely. And if revoked, withdrawn or suspended, you must surrender that medical certificate to either one, the director, two, person authorised by the director, or three, a sworn police officer. And if the director revokes, withdraws or suspends your medical certificate, he must notify any aviation document holder of this action i.e. he informs your work if you're commercial or the aero club um, or anyone else that may be affected again covers his ass uh, alternatively you can return your medical certificate to the director and ask in writing for it to be cancelled hooray 4.2.12 describe the responsibilities of a license holder with respect to safety offences as laid down in the civil aviation act of 1996 and 43 and 44 so 43 endangerment caused by the holder of an aviation document. Every holder of an aviation document commits an offence who, in respect of an activity or service to which the document relates, does or admits to do any act or causes, uh, causes or permits any act or omission. If the act or the omission causes unnecessary danger or any risk of danger to another person or property. Every person who commits an offence against sex, subsection 1 is liable on conviction, or to conviction. Um, in the case of an individual, uh, it will be an imprisonment of a term not exceeding 12 months, or a fine not exceeding $10,000. Please remember that, that does come up every now and again. Uh, in the case of a body corporate, the fine cannot exceed 100000 um, and the provisions of this section shall be in addition to and not in derog derogation, um, so in derogatory terms, of any relations or rules made under this Act. 43A. Operating an aircraft in a careless manner. Every person commits an offence who operates uh, any aircraft in a careless manner. Um, any person who commits an offence against subsection 1 is liable for in the case of an individual, so careless, seven thousand dollars and uh, endangerment or dangerous, um, ten thousand. All right. So remember that because both of those questions could come up 
simultaneously in the exam. Uh, and in the case of a body corporate, uh, to a fine not exceeding 35000 So, endangerment is 10000 personal, or 10 times that if you're a body corporate, so if you're a group. Um, in a careless manner, it's 7,000 or five times. Um, so it's it's a lesser lesser charge, so it's a lesser fine. Just remember that and try and keep that in your head. So 10,000 for endangerment, 7,000 for careless. And it's five times for careless and 10 times for endangerment. Remember that, you should be fine. Uh, 4.2.12, responsibilities of license. Uh, Done that. Dangerous activity involving aircraft, aeronautical product, or, avi or aviation related service. So, aeronautical product could be anything like a drone. Um, aircraft, you're fully aware of that is. An aviation related service is just a catch all for anything else. So, every person commits an offence who operates and maintains or services or does any other act in respect of any aircraft, aeronautical products or aviation relational service in a matter which causes unnecessary danger to another person or property. Every person commits an offence who causes or permits any aircraft, aeronautical products or aviation relational service to be operated, maintained or service or causes or permits any other act to be done in respect of any aircraft, aeronautical products, and, and so you'll keep hearing aircraft, aeronautical products, and aviation relations service. It's a catch all to make sure that there's no loopholes that people can fall through. Every person who commits an offence against subsection 1 or subsection 2 is liable uh, on conviction to, in the case of an individual, imprisonment for 12 months or a fine not exceeding 10,000 or in case of the body corporate, 10 times that, 100,000. So again, it's an endangerment, so it's 10 or 100 if you're a body corporate. The provision of this section shall be in addition to and not in derogation of any regulations or rules made under the Act. 43, endangerment. 44, dangerous activity involving. So, as a pilot or as a person slash company that holds any aviation document, uh, e.g. the right to fly or maintain aircraft, so your mechanics just as much as risk. If you do anything to cause unnecessary danger to another, any other person or property, you are committing an offence and can be personally fined up to 10,000 and sent to prison for up to 12 months. A body corporate can be fined up to 100,000, 10 times, operating an aircraft in a careless manner i.e. deliberately flying low over a right on lawnmower or uh, on the aerodrome that you're operating out of, um, entering a low-fly zone or entering or exceeding a low-fly zone um, uh, without uh, agreement. Uh, it's an offence and can lead to a personal fine of up to 7,000 or, if it's a body corporate, five times that. Right, cool. Ah, oh, definitions. These are... Wonderful, perfect bedtime reading um, if if you're really not sleepy because this is better than sheep. Car part one, unless otherwise noted, states the definition of A, an accident. So an accident means an occurrence that is associated with the operation of an aircraft and takes place between the time any person boards that aircraft with the intention of flying and such time as all such persons have disembarked and the engine or any propellers or rotors come to rest. So, by the time you get in a plane, doesn't have to, the engine doesn't have to be running or anything like that, by the time you get in a plane, you are then pilot in command, so your responsibility clock starts there. And the moment any prop rotors or engines have ceased, that is your time frame. Now, if a person... It, so the definition of an accident, uh, a person is fatally or seriously injured as a result of being in the aircraft, of course if it's in the aircraft and you're pilot in command then ultimately they're your responsibility, or direct contact with any part of the aircraft including any part that's become detached, so anything that falls off um, from an aircraft, or direct exposure to jet blasts, except when the injuries are self-inflicted or inflicted by other persons or when the injuries are to stowaways, so people that you weren't aware of, 
um, hiding outside the areas normally available to passengers and crew. So anyone that you knowingly carry, they are your responsibility at any given time. Anyone that you don't know, um, you have to maintain a, a, a fair and fit um, awareness around your aircraft um, because that, that will always be your responsibility. But anything you don't know of, um, is, it, it's their responsibility, but that will become contentious. The aircraft sustains damage or structural failure that adversely, adversely affects the structural strength, performance or flight characteristics of the aircraft and would normally require major repairs or replacement of the affected component. So if you're aware of something falling off or not working properly, um, again, your responsibility, you've been aware. Except engine failure or damage that is limited to the engine, its cowling or accessories. Uh, or damage limited to propellers, wingtips, antennas, tyres, brakes, fairings, small dents or puncture holes in the aircraft's skin. Or the aircraft is missing or is completely inaccessible. So, what that means is, most importantly, remember that the time an, an accident can be said to occur is between the time a person boards an aircraft with the intent of flight until all can't reiterate that enough. All persons have disembarked and the engine or any propellers, rotors, have come to a stop. So an accident involves a person being fatally or seriously injured, um, chipped nail, uh, nosebleed, um, uh, for, especially for helicopter pilots, so anyone flying over 600 feet as a helicopter pilot is susceptible to nosebleeds. Um, so this can be persons inside the aircraft, some hit by any part of an aircraft, or someone exposed to a jet blast. Note the exceptions. If injuries are self-inflicted, inflicted by another person, so passenger A smacks passenger B, um, or due to being a stowaway on the aircraft, the aircraft and accident is not said to have occurred. This absolves the pilot in command of any liability. But most importantly, time of an accident can be said to occur between the time a person boards an aircraft with the intent of flight until all persons have disembarked and the engines and propellers, rotors, etc. have come to a stop. All right. Very, very important. Very common, very common question. Oh, 4.4. More definitions. The Act means the Civil Aviation Act of 1990. Aerobatic flight, uh, an intentional maneuver in which the aircraft is in a sustained inverted flight or rolled from upright to inverted or from inverted to upright. Maneuvers such as rolls, loops, spins, upward vertical flight, accumulating in stall turns, hammerheads, whip stalls, or any combination of such maneuvers. The aerodrome, AIP Gen, means any definition. Um, now you can find these gen, uh, the, these AIP. Uh, these general comments, so these, these general descriptions, um, and anything in brackets AIP Gen means that you'll find them in the AIP General uh, section of the AIP Volume 4. Um, so if you do get these questions, you're not unsure, flip open your Volume 4 because you're allowed to take that in um, and go to the general part, find the descriptions, and, and you've, you've, you've got your reference point. So, aerodrome can be found in the AIP Gen. There's a definition area of land or water intended or designed to be used either wholly or partially for the landing departure and service movement of aircraft. Uh, includes any buildings, installations and equipment on or adjacent to such an area used. Aerodrome elevation can also be found in the IOP gen. Uh, the elevation is the highest point of the landing area. Uh, ATC service means the service provided for the purpose of preventing collisions between aircraft, between aircraft and obstacles on manoeuvring areas and expediting and maintaining uh, a safe and efficient flow of air traffic. An airworthy certificate uh, means that for a New Zealand registered aircraft, an airworthy certificate issued by the director under Part 21, subpart so H, you will hear Part 21 come up quite a bit, um, especially when we get to the airworthiness stuff, so the uh, 4.20. Um, uh, Part 21, subpart H, and a foreign registered aircraft, an airworthiness certificate is issued 
by the competent authority of the state of registry. So, uh, New Zealand plane issued by our director, technically an Aussie plane issued by the director of CIA Australia. Um, airworthy condition means the condition of an aircraft including its components, fuel and other materials uh, and substances essential to the manufacture and operation of the aircraft uh, that complies with all the requirements prescribed by the civil aviation rules relating to the design, manufacture, maintenance, modification, repair and safety. Another catch-all statement. <coughs> More part, so N. Alerting services means air traffic services provided to notify appropriate organisations regarding aircraft in need of search and rescue aid and to assist in such organisations as required. Um, altitude means the vertical distance of a level, a point or an object considered as a point measured from mean sea level. Apron. Again, you can find the definition of April in the AIP Gen. means a defined area on a land aerodrome intended to accommodate aircraft for the purpose of loading or unloading passengers or cargo, refueling, parking and maintenance. Um, ATC clearance means an authorization from an aircraft for an aircraft to proceed under conditions specified by air traffic control. ATC instructions means that a directive issued by ATC for the purpose of requiring a pilot to take a specific action. Uh, an aviation event all of that comes under Part 91, means an event to be conducted below the minimum safe heights prescribed under Part 91, that is, air show, um, or practice for an air show, air race, or practice for an air race, aerobatic competition, aerobatic training, or practice. Um, AWIB service means automated broadcast or aer uh, of an aerodrome and weather information provided specifically for the facilitation of aviation and for the avoidance of doubts an AWIB service is not an air traffic service. It's completely different. Basic weather report means a verbal comment in support of aviation describing any of the following current weather conditions observed at a particular place or airspace. So wind direction and strength, uh, mean sea level air pressure, air temperature, weather conditions and cloud cover. A ceiling, again a very common one, means the height above the ground or water of the base of the lowest layer of cloud below 20,000 feet covering more than half the sky. I'll say that again. The definition of a ceiling means the height above the ground or water of the base of the lowest layer of cloud below 20,000 feet, covering more than half the sky, so four octaves or more. Again, highlighted because it's a very common question. Uh, control flight means any flights that are that, that is subject to an ATC clearance. Um, cost sharing flight means any flight that is performed solely for the carriage of persons where the flight is not advertised to the public, uh, crew members receive no payments or other reward for their services, and the person carried by the aircraft including the crew members share equally in the cost of the flight. No, <coughs> no payments or other reward is required of a person on the flight other than the specifics in subparagraph 3. And, for the avoidance of doubt, a cost-sharing flight is not an operating for hire or reward. Um, Cross-country flight means a flight which extends more than 25 nautical miles in a uh, straight line distance from the centre of the aerodrome to, uh, of departure. So, in a 25 mile uh, nautical mile radius, um, you can fly that under your normal solo conditions or anything else, but you can't do it. Uh, unless you've got your cross-country component of your PPL license. <sighs> Dangerous goods means articles or substances that are capable of posing risk to health, safety, property or the environment and are listed in or classified in accordance with the ICAO's technical instructions for the safety uh, for safe transport of dangerous goods by air have properties that would result in the articles of substances being classified as dangerous goods under the ICIO's technical instructions for the safe transport of dangerous goods by air. Um, day means the hours between the beginning of morning civil twilight, MCT, which is when the center of the rising sun's disk is six degrees below the horizon, 
and the end of evening civil twilight ECT which is when the center of the setting sun's disk is six degrees below the horizon. Again, you'll see those quite commonly. You'll see them in your um, uh, FRTO exam. You'll also see them in the ELO exams. Um, dual flight time means flight time during which a person is receiving flight instruction from an appropriate licensed and rated pilot aboard a dual controlled aircraft. Uh, that's mostly specific, uh, specific to your logbook entries and stuff like that. Uh, emergency locator transmitter means the equipment that broadcasts a distinctive signal on a designated radio frequency that is monitored to facilitate a search and rescue operation. Uh, final reserve fuel means that the minimum quantity of fuel required to provide a margin to secure the safe completion of a flight in the event of an unplanned maneuver or maneuvering in the vicinity of the destination or uh, an alternate or suitable aerodrome in the case may be and in, uh, as the case may be and in ordinary circumstances remains on board until completion of the landing fit and proper person my god we've done that to death but means a person who satisfies the fit and proper person test specified in the act. Uh, flight information service means uh, ATS provided for the purpose of giving advice and information intended for the safe and efficient conduct of flights. Flight manual means a manual associated with a certificate of airworthiness containing limitations within which the aircraft may be considered airworthy and instructions and information necessary to the flight crew members for the safe operation of that aircraft. Flight plan means uh, specified information that is required under the rules to, prov to be provided to an ATS unit uh, or to the flight following service regarding an intended flight or portion of a flight of any aircraft. Flight time means the total time from the moment an aircraft first moves for the purpose of flight until the moment it comes to rest at the end of that flight, including all associated pushback, taxi, and subsequent holding time. Height <coughs> means the vertical distance of a level, a point, or an object considered as a point measured from a specific, uh, a specified datum and includes the vertical dimensions of that object. Of a taxi, that's, that's mainly helicopter stuff, uh, instruction to helicopters to proceed at a slow speed um, above the surface, normally below 20k or a good walking pace, uh, uh, sorry 20 knots, and in ground effect. So you have the ability to drop without killing yourself and not too fast that you could kill others. Um, an incident means any occurrence other than an accident that is associated with the operation of an aircraft and affects or could affect the safety of an operation. Landing area. Again, you'll find that in the IAP uh, Volume 4 under General. That part of the movement area intended for the landing or taking off of aircraft. Uh, night means the hours between the end of evening civil twilight, we've done this one, which is when the center of the setting sun's disk is six degrees below the horizon, and the beginning of morning civil twilight, which is the center of the rising suns, because it's morning, disk is six degrees below the horizon. You can get one, two, or uh, one, or the other, or both of these questions on the exam. Just remember, if it's night, then it's the rising, um, for the for the beginning of morning, um, read the question carefully because they're going to have the definition of morning and the de de definition of evening on both of those. If you get asked those, um, so just take a moment, think about it. Um, if it's the definition of night, so the end of evening civil twilight, which is the center of the sun's disk at six degrees below the horizon, setting suns, and the beginning morning civil twilight, rising suns, disk six degrees below the horizon. NOTAM means a notice distributed by means of telecommunication containing information concerning the establishment, condition, or change in any aeronautical facility, service, procedure, or hazard, the timely knowledge of which is essential to the person concerned with the flight operation. A passenger in relation to an aircraft means a person carried by the aircraft, preferably with their consent, other than a crew member. Uh, a crew member is defined as a person carried by an aircraft who is assigned by the operator to be a flight crew member, flight attendant, or has another duty associated within that flight 
uh, qualified flight instructor or even a aircraft engineer on a trial flight. Um, a crew member also covers flight instructors and flight examiners, flight engineers and flight attendants that are under training are counted as crew members. Personal locator beacon means an equipment that broadcasts a distinctive signal on a designated radio frequency to facilitate search and rescue and is designed to be carried on a person and is manually activated. Um, so that's almost the same as your aircraft locator beacon, slightly different, but if some some legal constraints means that you can get away without uh, an ELT, uh, you can get away with a personal locator beacon if you're carrying, but again we'll get into that later on. Piling command in relation to any aircraft means the pilot responsible for the operation and safety of the aircraft and whose ass gets kicked if it all goes wrong. Uh, rating means an authorised uh, an authorization entered on or associated with a license certificate or logbook and forms part of it, uh, stating specific uh, special conditions, privileges, or limitations relating to that license or certificate. SAR time, search and rescue time, means the time nominated by a pilot for the initiation of alerting action. Uh, simulation, uh, sorry, simultaneous uh, operations. Again, you can find that in the AIP. Volume 4 under general. Uh, simultaneous operational visual conditions is operations using parallel runways where both may be in use at the time in accordance with the following criteria, excluding provisions for wake turbulence separation requirements. So, uncontrolled aerodrome simultaneous independent operations with displacement between parallel runway center lines not less than 210 meters. Controlled aerodrome. Aerodrome control service on watch. Um, simultaneous independent operations where ATC controls aircraft with displacement between parallel runway center lines not less than 210 meters, uh, not less than 165 meters edge to edge if grass runways, or simultaneous dependent operations where ATC controls aircraft including sequencing or sta uh, staggering operations to avoid side-by-side -side parallel flight or side-by-side -side maneuvering on a parallel runway or simultaneous segregated operations is where ATC controls aircraft departures on one runway and on aircraft arrivals on a parallel runway. God I hate that one. Uh, takeoff weight means the weight of an aeroplane at the commencement of the takeoff run and includes everything and everyone carried in or on the aeroplane at the commencement of the takeoff run. Threshold, uh, which is listed in CAR 123.3, means that point where a 1 in 20 obstacle free approach surface intersects with the runway surface. Uh, technical instructions means the ICAO document 9284 technical instructions for the safe transport of dangerous goods by air approved and published by a decision of the Council or the International Civil Aviation Organization under Annex 18 of that convention. Type uh, in relation to the licensing of aviation personnel means all aircraft of the same basic design including all modifications there too except those modifications which result in a significant change in handling or flight characteristic. Or in relation to the certification of an aircraft, aircraft engines or propellers means those aircraft engines or propellers which are of similar design. Unicom service means a ground radio communications service and an aeronautical mobile service providing local aerodrome information for the facilitation of aviation or for the avoidance of doubt, a Unicom service is not an air traffic service. And they go on. VFR flight means a flight conducted in accordance with the visual flight rules, vicinity of an aerodrome, uh, an area around an aerodrome where aircraft carry out maneuvers associated with entering, leaving, or operating within that aerodrome uh, traffic circuit. Visibility means the ability to determine by atmospheric conditions and expressed in units of measurement to see and identify prominent unlighted objects by day and prominent lighted objects by night. VMC means meteorological conditions expressed in terms of visibility, distance from cloud and ceiling equal to or better than specified minimums. Um, 
and visual reference, uh, continuous reference to the drying land and water. Um, so definition notes. Under part 91, there are many, many more definitions that are not labelled as syllabus requirements. Whilst learning these definitions is important to assist your understanding of the legal wording used in air law, um, you will only be asked one or two questions of definitions that we've just covered. So you cover those, you're pretty safe. If you get an exam and you look at a question and you go, oh Christ, I can't remember that. First of all, check the AIP gen under abbreviations, just in case it's covered there. Most of these are logical. Um, it's just the way the exams are written that really try to screw you up. All right, um, ABN means aerodrome beacon. AGL means above ground level. AFIS means aerodrome flight information service. AFRU means an aerodrome frequency response unit. AMSL means above mean sea level. ATIS means automatic terminal information service. AWIB means aeronautical and weather information broadcast. AWS means automatic weather station. BWR means basic weather report. CIR, civil aviation rules. TTHR means displaced runway threshold. ECT means evening civil twilight, end of daylight. ELT means emergency locator transmitter. FATO is final approach and takeoff area. ME1 means medical examiner who's class, uh, class one certified. Um, ME2 is a medical examiner who holds a medical examiner two certificate. Uh, MCT, morning civil twilight, uh, beginning of daylight. Uh, PIB, passengers of the board, Q&H, uh, is an altimeter subscale setting to obtain elevation on the ground. TALO means touchdown or liftoff area. Uh, TLOF means touchdown or liftoff area too. Um, VFR means visual flight rules. VPC means visual planning chart. Abbreviation notes. Again, just a few of the many aviation abbreviations and these are the only abbreviations required for the PPL air law syllabus. These can be found part 91 and AIP volume 1. Um, you do get some that are in uh, volume 4 but don't, don't worry too much about it. If you're doing your helicopters um, then FATO, TALO, TLOF, um, the, rest people, uh, the rest you both need to know. Um, not, not huge difference in the yellow exam between helicopters and fixed, um, but there are some some discrepancies. All right, right. Thank God we've got past lesson one, part one. Uh, now you're starting to see the joy that we've got coming when we do the rest of the lessons and parts. So, what do you remember? What are the requirements if you notice a change in your medical condition which will affect your ability to safely exercise the privileges of your license? Are you going to inform the aircraft owner that you need to stop flying until the condition clears? Notify your local aero club and continue to fly? Advise the director as soon as possible, continue using the license as required? Or stop using your license and advise the director as soon as practicable? 4.8 we, we, well, I think we did that to death. Um, that was my mistake actually because it should say director as soon as practicable. Um, because it's the definition of terms outlined in uh, the air law uh, 4.2.8. So, just remember, if you see practicable, um, it's probably going to be the right answer. If you see possible, it's probably not going to be the right answer. Um, they make a great deal of effort in being able to identify the difference. If asked to surrender your medical certificate, who should you give it to? the director, a police officer, or anyone authorised by the director, or all of the above. You should have selected D, um, a person who has had his or her medical certificate revoked, withdrawn or suspended, or who is disqualified from holding a medical certificate for a specified period must surrender the medical certificate to the director, a person authorised by the director, or a constable police officer or sworn officer of the law. Which section of the CAA 1990 states the responsibilities of license holders with respect to safety offences? Section 1, Section 43, Section 61 or Section 91? 
section 43. 4.2.12 describes the responsibilities of a license holder with respect to safety offences as laid down in the Civil Aviation Act, section 43 and 44. If you operate an aircraft in a careless manner, what is the maximum individual fine you could receive? 7,000, 35,000, 70,000, or 100,000? Starting to feel like jeopardy. You should have had 7,000. Operating an aircraft in a careless manner, every person commits an offence who operates an aircraft in a careless manner, every person who commits an offence against this subsection, in the case of an individual, is fined not exceeding $7,000, or in the case of a body corporate, five times that for a fine of $35,000. Ram it home, these, these are very, very common questions. Between what time is an incident associated with the operation of an aircraft said to have occurred? From when the crew arrive at work until they have shut down and finished for the day? From engines starting until engines having stopped? Between passengers boarding until all persons have disembarked and engines, propellers and rotors have stopped? From the time any person boards that intends on flying until all persons have disembarked and engines, propeller, rotors have stopped. So you guessed it, between C and D. If you need to reread the question. But there is a key giveaway. And that's the word flying. Accident means an occurrence that is associated with the operation of an aircraft and takes place between the time any person boards the aircraft with the intention of flying and such time as all persons have disembarked, engines, propellers and rotors have come to rest. What is the definition of ceiling? The highest layer of cloud that covers the whole sky, the highest layer of cloud covering more than half the sky but below 20,000 feet, the lowest layer of cloud that covers the whole sky. The lowest layer of cloud covering more than half the sky below 20,000 feet. Yep, you guessed it. D. Ceiling means the height above ground or water of the base of the lowest layer of cloud below 20,000 feet covering more than half the sky. Which of the following statements is incorrect about cost sharing? A flight not advertised to the public? One where crew receive no payment or reward for their service? Operating an aircraft for hire? Splitting the cost of the flight evenly between passengers and crew? Operating an aircraft for hire. Again, freaky little questions. Reread the question. If, if you're starting to think it sounds too good to be true. So, conditions. The flight must not be advertised to the public. The crew members receive no payment or other reward for their service. The person carried by the aircraft, including the crew members, share equally in the cost of the flight. No payment or other reward is required of a person on that flight other than the specified in subparagraph 3. And for the avoidance of doubt, cost-sharing flight is not an operation for hire and reward. How far from your departure aerodrome does a flight have to be to become a cross-country flight? 10 nautical miles, 20 nautical miles, 25 nautical miles, or 50 nautical miles? You've got to get this one. Car part one, unless otherwise noted, cross-country flight means a flight which extends more than 25 nautical miles in a straight line distance from the centre of the aerodrome of departure. What's the definition of height? How high up are you in relation to a point off the ground that you've nominated? The vertical distance of a level, a point or an object considered as a point measured from mean sea level. The vertical distance of a level, a point, or an object considered as a point measured from a specified datum. The vertical distance of a level, a point, or an object considered as a point measured from your aircraft. 
key here is datum. When it comes to height, it's datum. Altitude is from mean sea level. <sighs> height means the vertical distance of a level, a point, or an object considered as a point measured from a specific or specified datum and includes the vertical dimensions of that object. What does the abbreviation ECT mean? Emergency cylinder temperature, evening civil twilight, engine cylinder temperature, none of the above. Yep, you guessed it, evening civil twilight, end of daylight. Well done, you've got through lesson one. Only four million more lessons to go, or at least it's going to feel like it. If you like this video, like, subscribe, make sure that you share. Please give a like, drop any comments that you need. Um, it's always great talking to the people that are, that are doing this because I realise that A, you have no life, and B, ultimately you don't sleep um, and you're trying to find a way that you can pacify that problem. Listen, love you all.